This was one of the worst crimes that I've investigated easily. Reported hearing gunshots. No, and there are no gunshot wounds, so. This scene in itself and learning exactly how it played out, I would not wish anyone to ever have to suffer such. It was absolutely brutal. Coming up. What are you doing? The attack itself was brutal. Full blown rage. Did you hear or see anything from the Koski residents? Well, earlier in the night, I saw them out having a cigarette, which was pretty common. When I arrived at the scene, I was able to gather information about my victim, uh, Kenneth Koski Sr. He was in his upper 50s. Um, he lived alone. He was a widower. The neighborhood that this attack this murder took place in was a very comfortable, quiet neighborhood. Officers had been called that evening in reference to activity, which is uh, very unusual for that area. At uh, 1.30 this morning, um, two houses down from this location, there was a prowler call, attempted burglary. A neighbor had reported a white male wearing no shirt and dirty, light-colored jeans outside of their residence. It was then later uh, discovered that another call had come in um, two doors down from that original residence. The husband then stepped out into the um, darkened hallway of the home and discovered what he described as a white male wearing no shirt standing within the, uh, the living room hallway of the residence. <laughs> shouting to the homeowner, I will kill you. The intruder then went to the residence of Mr. Koski. the attack and the assault ensued. What are you doing? Sit down. 
The attack itself was brutal, absolutely brutal. Mr. Koski, fearing for his life, made a run for the front door. Mr. Koski has got blood in his eyes, blood in his face. He's scared to death. But it was apparent that he did attempt to flee. The suspect then went to the closet where he exposed two shotguns. Both weapons were unloaded and would not be able to be discharged. The suspect then drags him down that hallway towards the master bedroom. The suspect then straddled Mr. Koski's body and then, by way of a knife, stabbed Mr. Koski in the chest three different times. Full-blown rage, unadulterated. Joseph McGrotha was on a list of possible suspects in a homicide which occurred in Warner Robins. And Officer Solis was unaware of this when he first confronted McGrotha. Keep your hands up. Show him your hand, Joseph. Why well, can see him? I don't see your hands. Show me your hands. Show me your hands. In that kind of a situation, you revert back to your training, which is a good thing, actually, for me, because my training went above and beyond uh, the, the average officer. Coming up. It's like it happened yesterday. I knew I had messed up. I thought, Pete, you got to move and shoot now, or you're going to die. Pete Soltis had a great reputation with the sheriff's office. People knew him, knew he was a professional. Well respected by his supervisors, well respected by his peers, trusted without question. He knew all the right things to say. He knew how to handle himself. And there was never any doubt if Pete was there with you, you were covered. Hands up where I can see him. Show me your hands. Well, I can see him. I don't see your hands. If I had passed away on that particular evening, at least I would have had closure with my family. In fact, this night, I got to go home and have dinner with my family. Great. Sorry I missed it. 
I promise you I'll be there on Saturday. I got to tuck my kids in bed. That's what you. And uh, kiss the wife goodbye. You know, in police work, you don't get to do that very often. It's like it happened yesterday. I knew I had messed up. I mean, I knew I had put myself in a bad position. The first round hit me dead center of the chest. First round is fired probably a foot and a half away from me. It hit here, it penetrated my vest in about four or five layers of Kevlar where I had been shot at uh, multiple times, but I'd never been hit. I honestly thought that I was, you know, I thought I was bulletproof. My next memory is he is out of the car. I know he's firing because that slide is moving slowly. I mean, it's tracking to the rear and coming back forward. And every time it tracks to the rear, I can see a casing travel over his right shoulder. So I knew I was hit, but I didn't have any pain. It was just an impact. It's like a slap. Um, and right behind it was another slap. I fired, I think, three to four, maybe five rounds at this point. I couldn't respond to this. Physically, I was frozen in, in that spot, in that time. In a stressful combat firefight, like Pete was in that night, you have what we call an adrenaline dump, and you're only concentrating, you're only seeing what the threat is to you. I counted one, two, three, and on the fourth casing is when I knew, Pete, you gotta move and shoot now, or you're gonna die. We're firing back and forth at each other, and apparently I've hit him because he disappears for a second, and that's when I made the push to my car for cover. By turning my back, it allowed him to stand and take two very good, well-placed shots. He hit me in the back, just narrowly missed my vest, drove through my shoulder, and blew out my uh, tricep area here. It did motivate me to get around that car pretty quick. I wanted additional firepower that was in that trunk. And uh, I could never get that key in. It just wasn't happening. He was running back and forth from bumper to bumper. He was screaming. I mean, he was just, he was in a rage. I remember even shouting past him at one point uh, as if I was talking to other officers on the scene. Take cover, he's off! <laughs> Hoping that it would get his focus off me for a second. It didn't work. In fact, he was laughing at that. <laughs> But apparently, some of the rounds that I fired at him did hit their mark. One of them broke his wrist and went down and broke his elbow in the same arm. So it made him a one-handed shooter. Apparently, he didn't train to be a one-handed shooter. Up to that point, he was pretty good with his hit ratio. It really diminished his ability to be effective at that distance, and he was hitting everything but me. They gave me just a, a brief moment to kind of take a breath, and really get my faculties at that point. That's when I got fixated on this wound that I took to the thigh. It was spurting blood up onto my mark unit. I knew that if it had hit a bleeder, a major bleeder in my leg, you know, and I had 45 seconds on this earth, you know, I'm gonna bleed out and it's game over. And that 45 seconds on this earth was gonna be, um, I needed to get busy. And at that point, I mean, everything switched. He just didn't realize it. Up to this point, I was a victim.
I didn't know how mobile I was going to be, but my thought process was simply, I'm not going to leave this parking lot, but it neither is he. After the initiation of this murder investigation in Warner Robins, Georgia, we compiled a list of suspects, people who had been involved in various criminal activities to include assaults, robberies, burglaries, things of that nature. Many of these suspects we felt could very possibly have been responsible for this incident. Kenneth Kosky lives a quiet, peaceful lifestyle. And then suddenly he's awakened by a monster breaking into his home. Now he is a victim of this brutal, brutal attack that ultimately ends his life. One of the pieces of evidence that we were able to gather at the scene was a shoe impression found at the back door of Mr. Kosky's residence. During the crime scene processing, our crime scene investigator located within the home one cigarette butt. Hey, Mike, you might want to check this out. But found it right there. Did you hear or see anything from the Kosky residence? Well, earlier in the night, I saw him out having a cigarette, which is pretty common. You smoke outside a lot? He never smoked in the house. I felt that this cigarette had been smoked by my suspect once the suspect was inside the home. I had opportunities to uh, interview many, many people about anything that we thought might remotely lead us to determining who was responsible for Mr. Kosky's death. We got a bunch of shots fired at the corner of uh, uh, Emerson and 95. How many shots? Uh, multiple. There's a policeman there. He was. They were both firing back and forth at each other, two cars. Who the police officer was? Oh, yeah. Who was shooting at the police officer? <laughs> When I got behind my car and could catch my breath, I'd already been hit five times. The guy was smiling throughout this entire event. I mean, it's like he was enjoying it. I mean, I wasn't looking at the same guy. I mean, the guy that I had out of the car four or five minutes earlier was very non-assuming, non-threatening, just the, the average Joe out there trying to get home. This guy was not. He just was committed, and he was not, he was not gonna go down. That's when I got fixated on this wound that I took to the thigh. 45 seconds is the length, generally the length of time it will take if you sever that artery 
to go ash gray and be done, to bleed out totally. Second thing that uh, was glaringly apparent to me is I could hear a woman screaming. I fired a lot of rounds at this point, and God forbid I've got any collateral damage or I've hit an innocent, uh, you know, that was concerning. You know, I'm not gonna let him leave to hurt anybody else. A relative calm came over me. All I knew is that I had a time constraints now. I said, okay, I've got 45 seconds at best, and I'm gonna leave cover, and I'm just gonna attack him. You know, I'm already hit, and I'm gonna have to take the fight to him to end this. He started out in this firefight with a, with a black weapon. He now had a silver pistol in his hands. He had two weapons in that car. First thing I wanted to know is, could I reload? Because this guy was not going anywhere. He did what we call a combat reload. He kept firing and firing until he thought his magazine was about empty. He dropped that magazine out and put another one in and kept firing at the suspect. I put my chin over the weapon because I wanted to hear and feel that magazine seat. I wanted to make sure that when I left cover and, you know, to attack this threat that uh, my magazine didn't fall out. And at that very moment, he left his cover. I said, okay, I've got 45 seconds at best, and I'm gonna leave cover, I'm just gonna attack him. At that very moment, he started to advance on me, and, I, and I'm fairly certain I know why. He saw that magazine hit the pavement, and he knew he had hit me multiple times, and he probably felt like the officer is done, or he's on the way out, and I'm gonna kill him and get that he, I had his ID pinned to my lapel. I think that's what he wanted. That was his identification. That was putting him at the scene. I'm watching him come. He is not in a hurry. He's just heel to toe walking directly at me. And I'll never forget, I could see the hair on his legs. That's the kind of focus you have at this point. That was probably the hardest part of this whole incident, is having to stand there and tell myself not to move, to wait. And he stopped just right in front of my car. <laughs> That's when the smile left his face. He backed up, and he went airborne and went right over the back of his car. I knew, without a doubt, I had hit him multiple times. Honestly, I thought I had Freddy Krueger on my hands, you know, because this guy just will not go down. He was now a mobile threat in a motor vehicle, and I had to stop him. As he starts his car, he puts his hand back on that weapon. But that gave me an opportunity to get a two-handed grip on my weapon and squeeze off two well-placed shots. He lunged forward into the steering wheel, and then he straightens himself up. He fixed his hat, rearms himself, and places the car in gear. I am putting all my rounds through a hole about that size, through the back windshield. This is eight, nine, 10, 11 rounds in, in about three seconds. He has thrown this car into drive and the car lurches forward and it impacts that fence and just rests there.
I could hear what we refer to as that death gargle. This just air is leaking out of the lungs. And I knew that you know, the life is leaving from him at this point. HQ, let's go up to 34, I've been 18, I've been shot. I have enough sense at that point that I'm not gonna escalate and move to the vehicle. I'm, I'm calling this in. I'm just gonna hold what I got and be thankful I've got that. We have that responsibility, you know, to get him help too. So that's what I did. I called, called rescue for, for both of us at that point. Told him that I had been shot, indicated that he had been shot, I need to back up and rescue you on the scene immediately. And I'm just catching my breath. You know, this is a minute and a half of exertion. And then I look left and I see what appears to be a white male running across the street at me full speed. Hey, man, are you okay? I saw that whole thing. Sorry, dude. I was just trying to see if you're all right. It was a family that had pulled over with an infant in the car. They had a flat tire. That's the woman that was screaming during the firefight. <laughs> He had exited the car to get that tire changed, and when the gunfight started, she would have had uh, she would have had a direct visual into the into the firefight itself. So she made a decision. She she looked back at her husband, and then she looked at the infant. And her job was to protect the infant. And I've been told that she jumped in the passenger from the passenger seat to the driver's seat, and left the scene, and left her husband with the spare tire at the scene. Turn my concentration back on the car and understand I didn't know if I'd be standing much longer anyway. This round that hit me in the vest is killing me. I ripped my uniform shirt open. I pulled that vest back and I looked and I was wearing a white t-shirt. And I can remember this is 